Okay, thank you. Well, um, I'm going to talk about an idea, uh, two challenges regarding this idea. Well, the title of my talk is Predictable Constructivism. So let's start with the motivation. All this works so this focus on a paradigm shift from uh, building artificial intelligence by programming by hand to a new strategy of making them grow by themselves, evolve and adapt to new circumstances to solve some problems. The reason for this is um, that we are, in a sense, finding a situation where the traditional ways of doing software engineering or AI are no longer working. Construction is refers to this traditional way of doing engineering, having top level goals and from those those goals by the composition going down into the details and implementing finally the details in simple language. Constructivist means a different approach where the system is creating itself in an interaction with the world. In a sense, the system starts from very basic bottom aspects and grows up into the generation of high level competencies that help solving the problems. I mean, that's the idea of this approach. So, the motivation is apparently the fact that uh, current AI technology is not solving the problems as well as it should be. And there is a reason for searching new things. <coughs> and there are many factors that are causing these, these, uh, these problems. One is the problems of programming large scale systems. The problem of scale, what happens when the system is growing? What happens with the programming? What happens with the team of programmers that we need to program the system? How the system is behaved as a single entity in a coherent way? That's a very big problem. Limited integration, lack of flexibility in those architectures, limited predictability when things go wrong, emergent, undesirable emergent properties have plenty of problems out there. But perhaps a constructivist strategy could solve. So in the, in the opinion of some people working in this field, this approach is the only way for solving those problems. And I question this. Is this right? Are reasons to trust this new strategy or not? And I will make a comment concerning this from a particular perspective, that is the perspective of what are AIs for? Traditional discussions about fundamentals in AI are related to the discussion of what intelligence is. It's just task-oriented information processing. What is intelligence? But I want to focus on a different aspect, it is the aspect of artificial. What is artificial in this context? And I will consider particular classes of systems. Systems that are agents doing things somewhere in a particular environment that is affecting their own behavior and that they have some goals in that particular environment. This is a classical example of an AI system. We know that the intelligence of this particular robot is not very high in it. But there are plenty of systems out there that are in need of lots of AI. And I'm referring to technical systems that are providing services to society of high importance. From factories or energy plants to modern cars, trains, communications, whatever. Plenty of systems that are fully computerized, fully controlled by computers, making decisions all the time, in real time, to confront problems and to keep some, something going on that is of high value for us. This is the context of uh, real artificial intelligence in a sense. Taking from the inside of the computer, taking from the theoretical aspects regarding mathematical rules, for example, or the theoretical aspects regarding games, into the real context of systems that are physically performing and doing some actions. 
So what is artificial in this context? Artificial is not made by humans, it's not non-natural. Artificial in this context is specifically made with a purpose. So we need to consider in all this question about the search of new technologies for building AI systems. If these technologies can help us providing that technology that gives us the solution for achieving that purpose. So the purpose is a critical aspect of building artificial intelligence. So an artificial intelligence is a system built with a purpose. And this particular purpose is to produce some value to someone that is the owner, the one who pays for it. And it's going to provide that value by means of intelligence, by means of thinking, of processing information, of making decisions, of applying concepts, doing whatever an intelligence is doing. But the question is to provide that value. This might sound a true, a true application oriented, far, far from general aspects of intelligence, but it is not. It is not because if we consider general aspects of value and how value needs to enter into the picture of building AIs. So it's a question of importance how a general artificial intelligence is going to handle value in this particular sense, as value to be provided to the owner and not to the artificial intelligence system itself. What value produces a mass role, what value produces a material system of the story? What values can produce a general intelligence? Can an artificial intelligence be built to provide general value? Can this be really put into the system as a general asset? I mean, not just building an AI for a particular purpose, but building an AI for a general purpose. The question at the end is a question of the AI making decisions in time. Making decisions in a particular instant about what is going to be the future, what is going to be the trajectory in a particular state of space. For example, considering the game of go before. And making the decision now concerning a value that is going to provide it in the future. And if the system is following different trajectories, the final value that we are going to get, or the value that the owner is going to get from the particular decision made by the AI at this particular moment is going to be different. So AI is, in this context, fully involved into anticipation and prediction of trajectories, of behavioral trajectories, of the system itself and the environment of the system that are hard to say. Hard to say. Well, those systems that are being deployed into machines, those AIs that are making decisions in real time, are doing a very important work and a very risky work in time. So it's not that just a question of if the system is able or not to make that decision. The question at the end is, is the system able to make that decision and we can trust that particular decision all the time? It's a question not just of the capability of making decisions that are right decisions, but the dependability that we can put on those decisions continuously and all the time. And this is a critical step if we are going to let the system create itself. Because plenty of systems are dealing with very, very hard conditions that are very risky and where errors in decision making can cost lives. So it's a question of importance to be sure that the value that the system is going to provide is not going to be sacrificed in the process of the system evolving and creating itself. And the word for today is requirements. That is a classical world in engineering and it's a very important word, I think, for artificial and general intelligence and it's very important for artificial intelligence in general. So what is the system going to give you in what conditions, what is the value that it's going to provide, what the system is for. And it mean, this means that it doesn't matter if we use a constructionist or a constructivist approach for building the system. We need, in both cases, the capability of design, at design time, if the system is going to give us the value or not, and in what conditions. So this is the real problem for engineering, and it's a real problem from constructivist AI to what extent this technology is predictable enough as to put it 
into real systems that we can depend on. So, constructionist approaches are touching the limits. And the question is, is constructivist a real alternative in this context or not? So let's make some consideration of architecture of systems. Agents that are environments that can be animals, humans, or can be machines. It doesn't matter in a particular context. Of plenty and plenty of architectures that we have around. Architectures that we typically describe using boxes that perform some particular functions. For example, getting information from a particular environment or thinking about that and finally acting. All those systems are always implementing loops. Loops of acting into the world. Getting, sensing, thinking, acting all the time. Plenty of boxes around, hierarchical, more astral, less astral. Plenty of relations, strategies, models, information processes, patterns, structured, decision making, always implementing loops. Always implement these loops and implementing those loops following particular theories about cognition or intelligence or whatever. For example, this is Stan Franklin's light architecture, an implementation of uh, Bernie Barr's global workspace theory of uh, human consciousness translated into a machine for making better decision making. Architectures based on boxes elements that are interacting, that are connected, interchanging information to make decisions. Well, this is another architecture. Boxes are growing all the time. And this is the problem that we mentioned at the beginning. When things, when those things happen, can we understand what's going on? Can we write the code and be sure that it's going to work? Or we really cannot do that? What was that? <laughs> Random. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have a question for you. What do you think is this? This is software or is it just a brain map? A human brain map? Too simple to be a brain map. <laughs> no, you know, brain maps are always too simple. <laughs> <laughs> there are no brain maps that are well, one to one. So. It's probably a small software system. Yeah, 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 it's yeah exactly. Very it's, small small system. it's basically a user interface for a, for a, for a controller. Basically, basically an uh, industrial product. A very simple thing. Some I asked the question because, because I had, when I put that, I was at the same time handling a, a, a brain map. And, uh, and uh, at some level of resolution, the things look exactly yeah. the same. Boxes and, yeah. and lines without any meaning at the end. Yeah, because and that's the wrong representation. Look, that's some software systems have millions of, co millions of lines of code these days. Yeah. So if you look at that level, then you're lost. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so what is the approach for understanding that? For example, there are people that are applying this complexity and network approaches to understanding, trying to understand large-scale complex software systems, trying to get information, statistical and mathematical information from all the topology and the connectivity of software systems, running software systems. For example, this is a graph of a particular node, one of, around one of the large, uh, better connected components in a particular software tool. This is a software tool for doing 3D modeling. And these people is trying to do an approach that is similar to the approach that we are using to understand the brain. Looking at the connectome in the brain and trying to think about the connectivity between the hippocampus and the amygdala to see if those connections are relevant or not. In a sense, software is getting so complex that we are using the tools that we are using for complex systems in nature to try to understand them. But is this going to solve our problems? We all are experts in software and know that a statistical approach to software understanding is just going to provide some statistics, some, some, uh, some papers. But it's not going to make the system work because software systems fail for a single bit. And single bits get lost into this picture. So you can get this rough description of the system, but at the end, you really cannot use it to make the system work in a very precise sense. So well, this takes back us to, well, gestalt psychology, for example, this relation between the holes and the parts and how the global behavior of the system is affected by the parts and how the parts are affected by the global system. So the things are the same, are always, are always related. And the question at the end is, what is the structure of the system? 
and how this structure, when put in a particular environment, generates a particular class of behavior. And, uh, for example, following clear analysis of general systems theory, he describes three classes of structure into the system regarding the degree of change that they are showing. And Clear talks about the real structure of the system, that is what remains across the lifespan of the system. What he calls hypothetic structure, local structures, local in time structure regarding particular activities that the system is doing, and what he calls the program, things that are continuously changing in the system. So there are levels of change, in a sense, different time scales of change inside the system. And those time scales of change make the systems behave differently regarding the time scales. And it's important if those systems are interacting with the other. So at the end, the question is how should we organize the system functions to provide the functionality that we need? Can we do that by hand using this constructionist approach? Or due to the complexity, we need to, the, to embed the system the capability of making this organization change by itself to do to solve the problems. And I want to focus the attention on a particular aspect, uh, at least the aspect of function, what function means. We talk about different functions in our systems. We talk about perception or what we talk about a database or, or search engine or whatever. And we talk about functions. But there are two aspects of functions. One aspect of function is what a particular component is providing. And the other aspect of function is what is the effect of this in a particular context. When we say this function is computing something, or the function of this module is to help this other module in solving that problem, we are talking about two different things. One is the internal dynamics of the systems, the means that we are using, the functions we are providing in an input-output description, and another aspect is the role those functions are playing inside the larger picture. The ends, why those modules are inside the system. So we have these two aspects: how means becomes become ends, and how the integration of different parts that provide dif that use different means generates a system that provides a particular end relative to this goal. What are the links between means and ends? We saw that in the previous talk by, by Eric. We made decisions and go, what are the ends of the particular strategies that we are applying? And the problem is when a, when a particular strategy that you are following ends into a particular result that you really like or dislike, but you don't understand. So there is a dual understanding of this concept of function that is critical for, for our understanding of systems. And the problem for us and dealing with a piece of systems, if that we can put functions out there inside the system. And the system can be composed by a series of elements that by coping generate higher level functions. And we intend those functions to give some values in terms of goals that the system is achieving. But the problem for us is that those functions are in terms of the system, but those goals are in terms of the owner all the time. And the system is just providing this and we expect this become that. But those are two different ontologies. The ontology of the system as it is, and the ontology of the designer or builder as it wants the system to be. And this mismatch between those two ontologies is what makes this problem of constructing systems so difficult, and what makes the problem of building a system that controls itself be useful for some. Because if we make a system that is able to control its own structure, its own functions, its own organization, how can we guarantee that the merging functions are going to be what we want and not what the system wants? So we have this relation between the value that the system is providing or we want the system to provide and the structure that the system has has in a particular moment and that renders or doesn't render the value that we want. Going from a particular structure into a behavior, hence a value, is an easy thing. Just execute the software, simulate the thing, you will see what happens and you will see you get or not the value. 
going the other direction from the value to the structure that is going to provide that value, this is an inverse problem. This is the problem of design, and it's a hard problem, obviously. And this is the problem that must be solved in real time by constructivist approaches if the systems are going to adapt themselves to provide some value to us. Not an easy task. No. So all this is based on a particular strategy that I call the self gamut As we engineers are unable to make the system work, we are moving the responsibility into the system itself. So let it, let it manage itself. So do the thing. So the system becomes autonomic, handling all the stuff, all its element to keep the mission fulfilled. We only specify the mission and the system adapts. So, so. But the question at the end is how the machine is going to understand this relation between the structure and the function in terms of value that is going to provide to you. There are plenty of systems today doing this. Different scales with different levels of complexity, with different levels of dependability. For example, systems handling critical infrastructures, they do adapt all the time. They change their structures to overcome problems, overcome attacks, overcome different aspects that are affecting the operation. This is happening today, so it's present-day technology. And it's not new. It's a very old thing. Adaptive controllers from 30, 40 years ago were doing this all the time. A particular controller controlling a plant had a meta level observing the global behavior making decisions and evaluations, and redesigning the operation of the system itself. This redesign could be just in terms of some parameter change, or could be in terms of different things. For example, for tolerant controllers, not just tune parameters, but change the structure of the controller because something is faulty, for example. So this is all technology, and it's working and solving problems. But the problem here, well, the problem, the reason why it's working is because this relation between the structure and function is very simple. The problem is very simple. So it's easy to go from the problem that we are dealing with into the structure that is going to solve that particular problem. The design problem, the problem, the inverse problem from, of going from value into structure is easy in this context. That's the reason why, why we can engineer those systems using classical engineering methods and make them work. But when things are much more complex, things are not so simple. And we need a way of making the system understand how it's behaving, if it is providing or not the value, and feed back that information into the system itself. So it just to go to the challenges, there is feedback of this value on the state is, is critical for all the behavior of the system. When the feedback is used through, through a model for interacting with reality, we get our system doing things. When the feedback is used to tune model parameters, we are talking about a system that is moving with the world. So if the world is drifting, the system can follow it and control it. When we use the, the feedback to create a new model of the world, the system is learning and adapting to a world that is changing, not just drifting, but changing. And if we use those, that feedback to make the system change itself, its own structure, then we are talking about systems that are growing, changing, adapting themselves, moving into a configuration space. This structural feedback is the key issue for building constructive AIs, and is the highest manifestation of intelligence, a system that changes itself to enhance its, its effectiveness. So let's go to the two, two challenges quickly. So the, in this context, we have two opposing forces. One is to overcome problems of scale, or whatever the problems are concerning current day AI. And the second problem is do that, but keep predictability. Seems a difficult thing, because if we make the system more complex, predictability will be, will be lost. So it's a difficult thing, a difficult problem. And the, the, the core of the question that I want to, to ask is, if we have a system that is composed by different parts interacting functions, organizing a certain way, 
that is evolving, that is moving, adapting, changing, that is growing. So the system is moving, it's across its own configuration space. The system can have very different configuration and have very different organizations. And the question is, what are those organizations? Can, can we be sure that those systems are not going to be dangerous in a sense? So the basic risk of the constructivism is that the system, when freed from designers, freed from top-down enforcement laws, is going to wander in this design space. And most of the time, the system will just crash, will die. This is evolutionary way of doing things. The system will die, nothing will happen, another system will replace it, so that's okay. But when the system is a critical system, this is not a, a bad strategy. Because if the system dies, some people can die with it. And that's a very big problem. And then I go to the two challenges for you. Challenge one, how can we get what we need? Challenge two, how can we avoid what we need not? <laughs> so to put in other words, how to be sure that a constructivist system will develop value for the owner, not for the system itself, but for the owner. And the second way, the second challenge, how to be sure that a constructivist system is not going to be spoiled to end in a particular configuration that is just rubbish or worse than that? How to avoid those regions of the configuration space? So the right constructivist will make a system evolve, but will constrain the ways it is evolving, avoiding those regions of the configuration space that are risky for us, not for the system. And how can we enforce this? And just to finish, is there a way forward? Well, if systems are going to create themselves and we still want to trust them, we need to, we need to impose requirements on them. That is a need. So we need top-down construction of a self-building system. We need a, 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 a mixture of all of the, both strategies at the same time. We need a constructionist constructivism, so to say. The key is to achieve a way of having predictable constructivism. How to do that? That's the question. There are ongoing things. For example, there's a workshop that is going to happen in, in England in two weeks regarding this particular aspect. Guided self-organization. How to make the system be self-organized, but in a certain direction. So that's the question. Still early. And I want to propose something. Chris mentioned before that software today is built by hand, as it was built 40 years ago. But that's not absolutely true. Some systems are synthesized from words. So there's a way of building systems today that is not just writing Java code or C++. It's writing a more compact representation of the system that is more dense, more related to the function and the value, and that, that representation, a model is transformed into the software. And that's a new strategy, but not new, but relatively modern strategy. And uh, focus on that, let's think about a system that is automatically synthesizing its so own software, but based on models, on models it has of itself, and models that we impose on this to push those top, top, uh, top down requirements into it. So the system has models of its functions, but has also models that constrain its own behavior. So the synthesis will produce systems that are not entering into those red regions of the configuration space. If we are able to do that, we can achieve AIs that will develop themselves, producing value for the owner, but not becoming a spoiled child in this particular case. That's Alright, let's give the card to